All right, sweet. So we're recording. Um, so welcome to the first MTI podcast. We've got Rob Kelson and myself, Charlie, here. Uh, we're going to be discussing MTI's first principles, which is a document written up by Rob uh, as kind of a guiding feature for the company. Um, so we'll just kind of dive right into this thing. Uh, Rob, if you could, what are the first principles? They're a decision making tool. Um, there's something to, to help guide effort and time did you have like yeah. a inspiration to create that because it's a pretty recent document yeah i listened to this one podcast these technology guys and they one of the major things they discuss are how technology companies are run and operated and they kept saying well you got to go back to first principles and i kind of like that idea of uh, they talked about the decision making at these companies and sometimes you miss your first principles and and get unfocused or head down wrong tracks and i kind of like that idea um it was just that idea the idea of first principles um the, the two words together and i decided to take a look at what um we were doing at the time and see if i could apply these to our work at mti why did you uh why did you think we needed them at that point? Was it just based off of learning about them or was there something going on specifically that made you take the time to do it? Uh, I thought it was an interesting thought exercise and an opportunity to, uh, uh, to again, make a decision-making tool um, that would help us make these decisions about effort and time. Um, so I didn't know if there was necessarily anything wrong going on at the company. We had been around for, over a decade but um so but i thought just another way to help improve what what we were delivering and doing and what what went into the creation of them did you use any examples from other companies or from previous research to to develop them uh, not much other than just the general concept and then taking a look at um i know Honestly, just to the general concept and digging into the different areas um, that we had used. I guess in my own mind, I had used some of these principles before, but had never formally laid them out. Gotcha. Um, so I'll just do like a quick overview of what they are. We'll link the article in the show notes, I guess. Uh, but categorically, uh, we've got the MTI athlete and what they look like. Uh, Programming ex excellence from our side in terms of our fitness programming, uh, quiet professionalism, which Rob has done a lot of work on over the past decade, uh, our approach towards customer service, uh, excellence in programming delivery, and community building. There's a bunch of bullet points in, underneath each one. Um, so we kind of, as a, I guess as a thought experiment, wanted to take a look at these and maybe try and pick them apart and see where they might conflict. So we've got a couple questions that we can point towards Rob and then potentially have some discussion based on it. Uh, the first being under the MTI athlete uh, category, one of the bullet points is professionalism and fitness. So athletes understanding that mission direct fitness is not merely personal achievement, but a professional responsibility. Um, so one of my points that, that we kind of fleshed out was, does this assumption mean that we're missing out on a wide group of athletes who approach fitness in a less prof professionally tied manner? So essentially, is this intimidating to somebody who might not have taken this approach within our audiences, you know, within the military, law enforcement, mountain, firefighting? Um, are we intimidating them? Are we, um, are we excluding a group of people potentially from training with us because of our approach? And then kind of as a second question, are we potentially taking taking the joy out of training? So that first question, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the early earliest decisions I made was not to call what we do working out. Um, I call it training. And the idea is that you're doing fitness programming with some type of end goal in mind. And one of the second decisions I made early on was that the end goal in mind is not a gym-based or a fitness-based achievement, but rather outside the gym performance. Um, 
And finally, the type of athletes that we work with, tactical and mountain athletes, can be severely injured or worse doing their job or their sport if their fitness lets them down. Um, so it adds an element of seriousness to the approach that we need to take as strength and conditioning coaches in the program design with a laser focus on designing fitness programming that improves outside performance and survivability for the athletes. For many of these athletes, fitness is a, isn't, it's a, you know, it's armor, it's um, a tool, um, it's a key part of their kit, if you would, if you'd say in, in terms of being able to do their job and, and because these sports and jobs are dangerous and uh, survive them or reduce injury or not get injured. So yeah, we're not interested in fitness as a sport or fitness for aesthetics or anything else. Um, does that mean that um, our programming isn't for uh, the general population or people not in these jobs? Yeah, I mean, that was a conscious decision. That doesn't mean that we don't have quite a few weekend warriors or just people who appreciate professionally designed programming that is progressed and assessed and is going someplace do our programming but our first customer and our first directive is to mountain and tactical athletes we're not i'm not trying to we never try to be everything for everybody when it comes to fitness and it's not it's not my job and uh or our focus and i i like the the uh responsibility that comes with understanding that if we don't do a good job people could get hurt really brings an element of professionalism and i guess care to the, the work that we do so um, it's it's not it's not just something light it's heavy and I, I appreciate that in my own work do you think potentially so obviously the fitness culture is of who we work with varies pretty dramatically. So there's a significant fitness culture within the military at large, um, probably less so within the firefighting law enforcement communities and probably even less so from a gym perspective for the mountain side. Um, so do you, do you think even within our audiences, folks, so let's just give a hypothetical, there's certainly a generational divide within law enforcement. Um, so there seems to be a split between older cats who uh, they've always done it one way and fitness hasn't really ever been trained and then younger cats who certainly uh, do prioritize it. Um, do you think that because of this approach and because it's so serious uh, and the way we communicate it is so serious that we're almost digging the moat deeper between those divides? Uh, I, I mean, it's not my responsibility to try to improve the fitness culture of law enforcement in general. Um, I, would, I would like to, um, but if you take a close look at that first principle, it doesn't say, it doesn't speak to groups, it speaks to individual athletes. So fitness culture of the military, um, I mean, different units have different fitness cultures and different individuals in those units have different fitness cultures. The primary advantage the military has over most first responder units is they have a high jeopardy fitness assessment or assessments. So if you don't score well on your assessments, you lose your job or lose your position, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, first responder units don't have that. If they did, their fitness cultures would be much better. Um, but what this means is that um, within the first responder, units that individuals who take their fitness seriously and are professional about it um, are are i think the ones that we're we're working for and they need those types of individuals and there are plenty of them out there um, need a source on how to train for the job and we provide that um, so i don't um yeah i'm not concerned about 
I mean, if those individuals are fit and training hard and they piss off the older guys in the unit to, you know, feel bad or whatever, that's that's not my concern. We, again, we're trying to um, work for those athletes. We're here for those athletes who, who want to train for the job professionally. So the, uh, the onus is on the individual, essentially, to recognize that fitness is a priority within their profession. Just like it is for all their other technical skills. Sure. You know, the, uh, um, I'm pretty sure law enforcement officer, general, you know, patrol guys don't get nearly as much time at the range that they probably need. And the, the guys are serious about their job uh, and their you know, shooting skills will take their own time to, uh, you know, buy their own ammo and, you know, get to the range. So just like every other technical skill, there's some, there's some individuals who, um, go above and beyond and uh, we're, we're working for those individuals. Gotcha. Kelsey, you got anything to add on that one? No, I just, I think the one thing to consider is, um, the young guys that are aggressively pursuing physical fitness, they're typically on a, a lower rung or they're just sitting at a different position than the older guys. So the, the actual physical demand for the, the guys that are like, we'll just say 20 plus years in either law enforcement or the military, um, they don't have the same physical demands as, as the younger guys. The younger guys are out on patrol, like clanging and banging on the streets and stuff like that to where the older guys are much more in a managerial role. And I think it's, I think that's something worth considering. Yeah. The only problem is if the younger guys and especially, you know, say the younger guys want to say it's a, uh, say it's a typical, say it's a small County sheriff's department and the younger guys would love to have a little bit of space in the garage and a little bit of equipment to train with and uh now the guys who are in the managerial role will say you know what i made it through 20 years of my job without ever having to do this stuff why do we need to you know spend this expense um so that that's where that issue has come up before and then also just in the stuff that i've seen uh, um, on the first responder units and maybe this will change um but uh there whenever there's an effort to spend resources on fitness or especially develop a fitness assessment um one of the one of the opposition groups are what they call legacy members and guys you made it without having to train and really you know they're in those managerial positions and they really just do not have to train for annual fitness assessment either so just some comments there, I guess. Cool. No, I, I I think that's that's definitely fair, and I mean each department is is like drastically different. There's like some very remote departments here in Montana that only have a few guys, and it's like there is a there is a huge separation on on what guys want and need, and and it's it's very generational, like like Charlie mentioned. One of the things that. I think is is pretty clear and that you'll see it time and time again in the military is a good example about it is that certain units certain within certain units within a, a general organization or in law enforcement certain you know organizations um, attract high achievers and it's pretty hard uh, to find high achievers over all their different skills, all the different skills who also aren't high achievers in terms of being professional about their fitness. In other words, uh, this has happened time and time again. I've seen where, let's well, see in the military, a good example, you know, the highest achievers will end up migrating towards the special forces units in the first responder units, the same thing, the same thing. The higher achievers will migrate towards joining the SWAT teams or the, the special um, fire department units. You know, where the busy um, stations in the fire department, um, they want to work hard. They want to be high achievers. And uh, and uh, across the board, I think you'll find that professionalism and commitment to fitness is one of the things that is consistent uh, amongst those individuals who end up at those units. From the first responder perspective, what can happen is if you have a, a county, for example, a 
a, a, a small county sheriff department, um, which is a little bit lax in all these different areas, and you have a high achiever who joins that department, they'll pay to get that individual trained up. They'll pay to send them to the academy, yada, yada, yada. And after two or three years, that guy's looking around and says, I don't like this culture. And he'll bail for another organization. And so that uh, that small county sheriff department has spent all these resources and this guy's able, able to lateral over to uh, organizations that's more professional. So um, there is a cost that way for sure. I've seen and, and many uh, first responder um, leaders have, have told me about. It'd be interesting to take a look uh, from a first responder perspective on how true that actually is. Because if you go to a large urban department, I think you'll see a pretty healthy mix of just from purely from a physical fitness appearance perspective, you'll see both sides of that coin pretty dramatically, probably the same at the local level. So I wonder if there's a big, uh, if there's a significant difference between, between the two. Well, if we could do a study, it would be a fitness assessment across the department and see if the individuals in the, more specialized units score higher on their assessment than the other individuals. I would, I would, my, my hypothesis is that they would. Yeah, I think that would definitely be true within the, within specialized units. I wonder if that's the case uh, from a more broad perspective across the personnel within the department at large versus the specialized units comparing mid and small and mid versus large urban. I don't understand what you're saying. If the, so you're making the case that let's, so somebody from a, a deputy from a small sheriff department uh, might make a lateral move to an urban department because there's more opportunities there uh, and it's perceived as a more professional organization. So like the NYPD, for example, which I think is generally considered to be a gold standard of law enforcement. Um, whether or not the NYPD at large across, let's say all of the guys who, all of their personnel who are in patrol, if their average fitness level is superior to that of a smaller department. Yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, but you're, you're uh, the, the point, uh, yeah, that if you're, you're making, uh, your argument is that that deputy is leaving his small rural department because he wants more action and more opportunity that might come from an urban department. Um, I guess the, the more applicable lateral for the point that I'm making is that guy would move from a small rural department that was lax to another small or lateral to another small rural department that was just run more professionally. Gotcha. Uh, and, uh, and part of that would be, and part of that would be seen maybe not necessarily run more professionally, but had a more professional culture. Uh, sometimes that can be irregardless of leadership, uh, but, uh, uh, and that could be assessed or it's possible that that would be seen to uh, fitness levels. Gotcha. Any other questions, comments on this one before we move on to uh, programming? Nope, nope, nope. Okay. Uh, so next one, major bullet point of the first principles is programming excellence. So hey, let's uh, let's let's step back. I, I have a question for Kelson about that. Sure. Uh, Kelson, in uh, in your work, you saw a different. I mean, you saw this in your work, didn't you? Didn't you see different? Not everybody was as professional about their fitness as everybody else, right? And were the more guys who were more professional about their fitness higher achievers or higher performers than guys you weren't? Um, for us, I think everyone maintained a fairly light, uh, high level of fitness. Um, some guys that, that were looking for screening for various programs, they would, uh, their, their fitness level might be a little bit higher, but it is very, um, very specific towards the screening of that program. So they, they train specifically for that. Um, but as far as, uh, NSW maintains a standard, um, and, and that's through, um, our human performance, um, team that each group has, 
and then we're we're tested on that every six months um so there's always there's always a standard and not only is like you have to meet that standard just being one of the huge things that happens is being judged by your peers and that's a lot of um that that in itself is a lot of motivation for guys just to like you know keep keep at it with their physical fitness yeah but you didn't answer my question um the question is what are the guys who seem more professional about this for example you could be on the teams and and do jujitsu every day um but that's not helping with rugging so they were training every day but they weren't training for their job for example you don't need to agree or disagree with that um or they were working out every day and not training did you see where the guys who were training for their job one of the things i've seen that I, I don't like big boy roles for fitness or marksmanship is that guys will do what they've always done or what they're good at if they're given a choice and want to train phys- fitness wise um, um so certainly there were different levels of achievement and performance within the teams could you link i mean was a high achiever in all the other areas also a cut above fitness wise or not um i would say that like almost everyone trains in like a hybrid athlete model so everyone's training for their job because um you can't it in nsw you can't, you can't perform your job if you don't train for your job so um yeah there's not a lot of guys that are off doing their 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 own thing if that makes sense okay yeah we can move on cool uh so going into programming excellence two of the sub bullets there is clarity and simplicity in the programming approach and continuous improvement uh, so my, one of my questions was, how do we check ourselves in learning from sophisticated programming design? Do we miss out on opportunities to improve our methodologies because they appear complicated and we may potentially disregard them? And can we improve our own processes in boiling down sophisticated and effective design to simple and effective design? So essentially, breaking that down a little bit more, uh, there's lots of good programming out there that probably achieves its objective but is fairly complicated and challenging to actually employ for an individual or in a group Uh, that doesn't mean it's not valid and doesn't mean that we can't learn from it Um, do you do you think there's been this is almost potentially a, a heuristic trap where we see something on paper it looks very complicated and then toss it to the side because it, it looks complicated, but potentially there's something that we could gain, educate ourselves further from. Uh, not purposely, but I'll, I'll describe kind of how, how MCI programming or developed and this is true, I think for anybody who is, who works in a type of field where you have something that is part science and part art so first, you know, when I started, I started um, by just deploying other people's programming. And um, I would see its effectiveness in the gym. I'd see how it worked with weight room flow. And um, I would identify where there were issues. And then um, I would apply, you know, to deploy one guy's programming and then deploy another guy's programming. And then I started putting parts of different people's programming together um, and kind of mixing it together and learning and then learning from that. And then I guess the final step in my own programming evolution was with this knowledge and after several years of doing this and lots of work, I took and now developed my own theory and started developing my own programming based on my theories. And so essentially I quit looking at other people's programming and started developing my own programming. And then others out there you know, are going through the same process and one of the well, and they're deploying some of my programming as they as they move along that process. So I think the question you you ask is if uh, you know I righteously discount um, complicated looking programming um, because it looks complicated and I don't think anything I can learn from it. Um, the answer to that is no, 
But one thing I don't think that I have done enough since we've been developing my own theory in deployment theory is I don't think I've stepped out and looked at other programming to, to where I can learn from it. It's pretty easy at my level of a coach to take a look at any um, program and quickly diagnose what the main exercises are, what the progressions, et cetera, et cetera. And if it's complicated to cut through that, cut through the, the complicated stuff and get to the essence of the program. And I think that one of the, one of the, blind spots or efforts that you identified in this question is not that I righteously discount the programming, but I need to perhaps start looking again at other people programming and, and analyze it to see what more I can learn from it. Um, I guess I've been so, we've done so much work at, you know, the, the I guess the final step, you go from deploying other people's programming to you know, putting people together, uh, different coaches programming together, you know, hybrid to developing your own. And then the next step for us, that a lot of coaches don't take is testing our own programming. And that's what we've done for years with our many studies and, you know, testing our own programming and, and different theories and continuing to evolve it that way. Uh, but there has been, um, I know it's, uh, I need to spend more time just doing the reading and looking at other people's programming across these different fields to see if there's anything in there that's interesting that we could tap in our, in our own stuff and see if we could bring it as a tool. So that's definitely something I, I see here. Um, so I guess I'm, I don't think I'm guilty of being righteous uh, in terms of discounting uh, sophisticated programming. Perhaps I am. <laughs> uh, but I definitely am guilty of not, uh, of maybe of spending too much time looking at my own programming and maybe that's, I've missed some opportunities to look at other people and, and see what else is going on out there. Um, there might be something that we can bring in or several things that we can bring in to add to our own toolbox. Yeah, it seems like it, I mean, this is from just my own experiences. It seems I can think of instances where I'm guilty of checking out somebody's programming and it being a fairly complicated design and just kind of rolling my eyes to myself and then pushing it to the side. Whereas, you know, there might have been some nuggets in there, right, where you can pull things out and polish them down maybe a little bit or, or adapt them to, to what we need in order to, in order to utilize. I, I could give an example there. Um, the triphasic training isn't particularly complicated from a, from a programming perspective, but it's definitely pretty complicated from a coaching perspective with athletes um, just because of the, the positions uh, being able to effectively coach somebody into a strong isometric position or a strong eccentric position. Um, and I did it once through a cycle with a group and then never really did it again because the coaching, uh, the coaching workload associated with in a group was, was too much. Right. Um, but I wonder to myself, if like maybe I missed an opportunity to, pull some things out of that that could have been applied differently or adjusted to to be more effective for you know the group that I was working with. Well that's kind of a different question. You can have something that's super effective but it's difficult too difficult to deploy and need to set aside because of that. Um, for example, the exercise. In our exercise menu there's an exercise called the exercise. <laughs> right. <laughs> And it's a hang squat snatch plus an overhead squat. And um, I've never really done a study on this, but this comes from Dan John. I spent a couple of days with Dan John one time in his gym. He was a high school and conditioning coach in Salt Lake. And, uh, and he he, uh, he said that for a football team, he just had his running back to do this and they would dominate. <laughs> they would do the exercise, like three of the exercise and then do a sprint. And they said, oh, that's all, that's all I had them do. And um, and so one of the problems with the snatch for a lot of men is shoulder mobility to be able to get in that position. And it's a technical lift. Um, it's not as technical as a power clean, um, but it's technical. Um, and uh, so it's a great exercise, but um, it could be the best total body exercise in the world. But if you can't deploy it effectively, you know, if I have – a stick of 10 men who can't get into the overhead snatch position because of shoulder mobility, 
and they're all operators or military guys or police, then how much time am I going to waste on trying to get the show mobility show ability to be able to do overhead snatch or hip mobility or whatever it is, um, where, you know, in a perfect world, you'd spend all this time working on mobility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you only have so much time to train with them. You got to get your, you know, licks in. And we actually did a study that found that the back squat is the best, you know, total body strength exercise more than the, more than the deadlift or hinge lift. And so your, your time might be better spent having them be the back squat, which is much more simple to do. So that's another consideration is sometimes the, the best programming, if it's not deployable, it's not the best or the best exercise. If you can't teach it effectively and consistently, it's not the best exercise. Um, it may be in a perfect world, but the world's not perfect. Kelsey, you kind of saw a bit of this. We've, we've spoken about this offline. We're working with NSW strength conditioning coaches that often would implement some complicated design in one way or another. What, what was your experience with that? Um, you know, we have a lot of really brilliant coaches in NSW. And I think, I think one of my biggest faults was probably just, um, laziness on wanting to utilize their programming because I would, I would see it and there'd be a lot of like scientific terms and a lot of movements that I didn't instantly, um, no, so I kind of discounted it and then and, and moved on to some other simpler programming um, to which I liked. Um, but I, I guess if I could go back, I wish I would have gave it more of a chance um, and and been consistent with it because that's the only truly that's the only time I I ever get results is through consistency. And I think there would be a a big education value of of having having given that more attention and. Um, so to to get back to your question, there is, they do they do have some some complicated programming in it, but they're also very good coaches. Um, it's just it's just a different methodology than MTI. We actually did a little bit of this. Uh, I will say that as from a programming perspective, every time I've gotten righteous about programming or an exercise or something, righteous being discounting it. Um, I've always ended up eating my words. Um, <laughs> and so that's one of the things that, um, I, you know, whenever I start getting righteous, I've matured enough where this red flag comes up in my own mind saying, ah, you're getting righteous here. You need to step back and I'll calm down. Um, this winter, like I, I'm 56, uh, and, um, I have knee arthritis and there's some guys online talk about, you know, how to work on your knees and and uh so um i thought it was bullshit because i like no way um <laughs> but with some of our remote lab rats and me myself i started doing some of these exercises which are pretty much really deep knee exercises and it hurts the hell first and i've actually seen some improvement from it um so it's, it's, it's interesting that uh i think that one of the things that we could do is you know, not only look at uh, somebody else's programming to learn from it, but actually just employ other people's programming. And uh, again, like Kelson saying, to see what comes out of it, you always learn something for sure. Um, and uh, you always learn something. And even if it's a, a new exercise, uh, like I, I remember one time me and an old coach, we went to this um, Two day seminar. We drove down from Wyoming all the way to Vegas for like two days, <laughs> and uh, I didn't learn anything about it. But I did deadlift variation called the hinge lift, which is a different way to to deadlift, which is use more uses more of a well. You can just look online and see our hands versus a typical deadlift, which is more knee bend than what we like to do. And I found that it was safer and um, and uh, focused on the posture chain better. And uh, I remember driving back kind of bitching about this seminar because we drove, I don't know how many hours. And this coach said, hey, you know, we learned this angel variation and it's it was worth the trip. And he was right, worth that expense, just learn that variation, which is, you know, stuck in our in our, uh, our programming sense. So you always learn something, even if it is what not to do. So, yeah, we should definitely do more of that. Uh, cool. 
Any other comments on this one? All right, so we'll move on to community building, which will be, I think, probably an interesting conversation. So one of the principles is community building with sub bullets of creating connections and fostering a professional community. Um, I think certainly Rob and I have talked a lot about this and efforts to do it. And I think it would probably be fair to say that we haven't been particularly successful. Um, why do you think that is? Is this a byproduct of the athlete type that we're working with that has the independent uh independent i'm not sure what the right word is but the the onus is on him and he understands that right the professional responsibility uh does that mean that you know they don't need the community uh is it a part of our quiet professional approach to business uh, or are we just simply bad at community building so you you kind of set these questions ahead of time charlie and i've had time to think about this and i kind of took a look at the overall first principles and i think that this should not be a first principle i mean what the hell does that mean community building you know um we've had good relationships with athletes over the years individual athletes and and individual athletes you know we don't you know most of the athletes who use our program are individuals so yeah I, i'm not too sure that uh, community building should be a first principle and it could be a distraction the efforts we put into it from from other stuff that we could be doing to improve the programming and improve the you know the product um, to the to the athletes who do use our programming so do we suck at it i don't know i mean who's good at it I mean, what does it mean? Um, it's so nefarious and and stupid. Um, I don't seem stupid, but I, I don't know that it, it's not that deep. Um, I don't know that it's that uh, deep of a concept. And and I think it could be a distraction from the things we're doing. So I don't need to evade the question, but um, I think there's this idea maybe in the most recent business building when it comes to internet stuff, you develop these online communities, whatever, and there's some kind of vibrancy, but they're all friggin' shallow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. So yeah, I think that, that uh, I think that in, in hindsight that I'm just gonna eliminate this from the first principle and focus on the other ones. Even if it is valid, we suck at it. Um, <laughs> maybe, and maybe we should just cut it out because we suck at it and do what we're good at. Uh, I think that's okay too. Um, I'm not sure if that's the answer to you're uh, you want but that's what i think i'm gonna do what do you guys think about that yeah i mean i think it there's some validity there right i mean <clears throat> so uh, i've done a portion of an online mba program uh and it was fucking miserable right i mean just you can't do the school aspect or for me at least, I didn't enjoy school in an online format. And I think what the the part that's missing is that conversation within a classroom, which is certainly a a kind of community, right? Um, and I think that just presents the online avenue presents a ton of challenges in terms of building a community. That being said, you know, we just just in uh, betas last Saturday's beta, we did that little outreach said, Hey, are you interested in doing training groups locally, MTI training groups? And I've gotten about 60 emails in the past 48 hours from folks all over the country saying, yeah, I'd love to be able to train with folks. Now, whether that actually happens, I'm, you know, I'm going to do the work to get this set up. so people can kind of cross communicate, which is, you know, in, in effect, some variety of community building, uh, whether or not that that actually takes off with folks, I have no idea. Um, but it's, it's certainly incredibly challenging. And I think you're right. There's probably, there's not a ton of depth to it. If you're looking for community via fitness, um, you know, you probably need to go to a gym. That's because that they're good at that because it's in person and there's shared misery and all that good stuff. Uh, but, you know, from, from where we are and 
the reach that we have, which is you know really a national uh, national and to a degree an international reach, um, it's going to be really challenging. And I'm not sure I'm not sure how to build that where it's it's not cheesy. Yeah, I, I can agree. I think uh, community building is another word, I think, for fans. <laughs> you know, just Taylor Swift, you know, she get a community building or she just have a bunch of fans. You know, there's a, there's a certain product or a company that sells stuff, you know, have a community or just fans. And so, yeah, I don't, anyway, whatever. We suck at it, and uh, I think it's just been a distraction. And uh, I think the idea of facilitating, you know, if people want to get together, that's fine. But uh, people aren't going to continue to use MTI because we have a strong community. They're going to continue to use MTI because our programming fucking works. Right. That's in that for our focus to be. And, uh, and it should always be working on improving the product. And, uh, and uh, this might be something that's been a distraction. That's kind of funny that I maybe built in a distraction, distraction to our first principles. <laughs> what a dumbass, huh? <laughs> you know, I will say that you always improve stuff by cutting stuff out. So I'm definitely going to cut this one, I think. What do you think, Kelson? Uh, I think I think there's some goodness in a community. It's, I, I kind of view... Um, like my particular role up in here in Kalispell is I can be, I can be a conduit to like connect communities, say like from like a fire department to some kind of law enforcement entity. If, if we're training with law enforcement and we're training with the fire department, we can essentially link those and those, all those people probably see them, see each other on a regular basis, but that might be an opportunity for those guys to train with them and like build relationships across the community. So I think, I think there is some some goodness in it. Um, it's just how how do you do that more than just like a regional area? Um, I think is the hard part, and maybe it is just as a distraction. Yeah, well, interesting conversation. It sounds like cut a uh, a chunk of uh, the first principles. So I think we're going down going down one from six to five now. Um, I'll move on going into excellence and programming delivery. And so two of the sub bullets there is user-friendly platforms and continuous improvement in our digital delivery systems. Um, so MTI had an app. What year did that app for the first iteration of the app come out, Rob? Oh, like 1996, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so we just did a pretty massive app upgrade that launched a couple of months ago um, and we were working on a legacy system. So th my question to Rob is MTI took a long time to upgrade its program delivery systems. Was there a rationale or reason behind, the, behind this? And this, was this potentially a lack of start to finish craftsmanship in terms of our product? Yeah, I think this is a, a really good example of Rob being righteous. Um, uh, and I just being, I just wanted to develop an app that gave you everything that you wanted and nothing that you didn't. And, um, and, and as part of that, I think I, and, and, and also I think I, there was a blind spot here too, where I focused on customer service in terms of you know our emails and getting back to people and answering programming questions directly and authentically and didn't realize that the ease of the app was a big part of customer service and then finally it's a generational thing i hate using my phone i hate texting i don't use apps really <laughs> i'm a i'm a old school laptop guy uh and uh, so generationally i um missed it so but the main issue is responsibility is on me in terms of just being righteous and, and certainly, you know, could have been improved it because there are plenty of complaints. Um, you know, I think I even was like righteously proud about how simple our app was. Um, but I think I confused simple with just being clunky and stupid. Um, and uh, so 
yeah, it just goes back to, like I said, every time I get righteous about something, I'm generally wrong. So, um, but uh, I think when he came on board, Charlie, we kind of took a look at this idea, and that's why I put it in the principle that understood that um, programming has to be good, first of all. If you can't access a program, it's a pain in the ass to see what you know, the exercises are. <laughs> we were talking about you know, a little bit earlier, we are talking about, you know, sophisticated programming, then it's, you know, if you can't access it, then it's not, it's not any good. So, um, I think it held us back, and now hopefully we're doing much better, and and uh, I want to know, because um, I, again, don't like using my phone, but I trust from you young guys that it's much better and much more effective. Yeah, it was kind of an interesting process. You know, we, we ran a pretty big survey, basically, a, a where can we improve? Uh, but I guess about nine months ago or so. And uh, I mean, that was certainly the biggest feedback was, you know, that app is clunky. And it was such an interesting process working with uh, with our app developer in building out this new one. Uh, you know, so we had our, our app developer and a UX expert that came on initially to help build out the design and certainly still tried to use those principles of like everything you need and nothing you don't i think we probably found a, a pretty good balance there we'll see I'm gonna, we're going to run some surveys here pretty soon on you know where this could potentially improve and it's always an interesting deal when you're um asking folks for feedback uh because it's easy to get distracted with a shiny thing so it, it takes a bit of focus to be like you know that that feature could be great uh but it's going to overly complicate the system and, and create more shiny things. And, and those, those tend to increase exponentially and you, you chase them and then you've got something that's overly complicated. Um, so it was such a, it was, it was really an interesting process working through it with those guys. Uh, but a lot of the, a lot of the features were fairly simple, uh, user experience tools, um, to make life easier, right? I would say probably the biggest one being, you know, a part of our programming is that it's assessment and progression driven, which means there's quite a bit of calculator work uh, to, to find your loading or your reps or whatever the case may be. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, so building the features in where that's pre-populated for, for the athletes so they don't have to, you know, that's, we kind of pride ourselves on having tight programming sessions right so most of them are 60 minutes and then you know, stuff like our busy dad is 40 or 45 minutes um and that's you know pulling out the calculator if you got to pull it out six times in a session uh that's six minutes wasted and uh, so it you know being able to cut down that time make things more efficient uh and provide a better experience has been s certainly really educational from my perspective I've, i enjoyed the process and i'm going to be looking to continue to improve on this and make it simpler and simpler while still having the having the features that we need to have to make sure that people can train without distraction or without without pause yeah long over to you hopefully we're catching up there for sure yeah kelson you're the most recently in the military i've been out for a bit now um uh, was that a complaint from guys who did mti training it's like what this app is from 2002. uh i i when guys heard that i was i was gonna start um working with you that one of the first comments was like what's the deal with their app um and so i think the yeah the steps you guys have taken is, is drastically improved it and i'm i think it's on a, a really good path. Well, hopefully I recognize my own blind spot because I pretty much told Charlie just to do it. And, uh, and, uh, so good, good work, Charlie, hopefully it's better for sure. It's hard to make it worse. <laughs> so far. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't want to go getting into giving people flowers and stuff like that, but I, I'll give Rob a lot of credit for, um, basically giving me a free reign of this project, which was, you know, you just won't see that, right? I mean, I, I've worked 
<laughs> a, a very large corporate organization previously. And um, that kind of freedom of movement on a project is, uh, I would say, probably non-existent, uh, at least at the level I was at. So, you know, being able to just attack it aggressively without worrying about somebody breathing over my shoulder is uh, is great. And I think hopefully it came out with a, a pretty decent product. Before we want to move on, I want to take a step back about that community. I'm certainly going to cut that as a principle, but I put a lot of effort into the work we do with our contributors um, to, the, to the beta and to the website and the essays that come in. And uh, we try to create stuff that's interesting and original and real deep. And, um, you know, I, I'm just looking at my emails and I have, you know, several drafts um, already from contributors uh, who do fitness on MTI and learn about us this way, but are, you know, writing essays about leadership, about um, professionalism, about um, experiences, and uh, I think that isn't uh, something that sets, uh, sets us apart. Certainly, if you ever, I know Charlie's written for me before, and uh, Kelson has, and, uh, you know, contributors have too, and it's not unusual to, you know, send stuff into me, and I say, you know, I make I make them rewrite it or <laughs> add stuff or cut stuff out or don't let their topic. I mean, it's not uh, it's not just you send it and it gets printed. It's a lot of work, and so uh, I think that is something that I don't know if it's a community building or whatever. But hopefully, we're providing a unique voice out there, and I think that some of the the work that we've done, you know, for this little sources, especially the original stuff, is I think it's high quality, and uh, I think others appreciate it. Certainly. It's really you do because we're getting you know applications all the time to be to contribute to TMTI. So it's inspiring others to write. Yeah, it's uh, a, you don't. There's you know I think anybody who peruses the internet these days will see a pretty distinct lack of authenticity. As much of a whatever word that is keyword these days, um, you know it's a some of the the MTI contributors, if you're not familiar with what that is, so these are MTI people who have utilize MTI programming. We we call, do a call out for contributors to write essays for us, and really the topics can be just about anything. I don't think you put any constraints on that. Um, and we've, I mean, they're pretty fascinating. I, I'm hoping to get some of those folks on this podcast as we get the ball rolling on this thing because they're they're really freaking interesting. Um, so, but one kudos to those authors because Rob is a fucking ruthless editor uh, and will give you some pretty brutal feedback um, and they stick with it and, and, you know, produce some really amazing essays. Um, but, but also too, just being able to provide a platform for folks like that, who have a lot of experience and uh, have gone through trials and tribulations, lessons learned, uh, being able to, to get it out there without, you know, there's nobody saying this, this needs to, we need to get these certain search engine optimization terms in there to make it get better clicks or whatever the case may be, right? It's just good written essays by people who have been there and done that. Uh, so I think that's certainly an aspect of community. Pro Rob probably hammers down on the community a little bit because of, because of how he <laughs> provides his feedback on essays, uh, but you know, comes out with a good product. Yeah, I, I get to the point. I hope <laughs> some people they know they submit stuff and it just it just doesn't work out. Their their experience is wrong, or you know sometimes we get people who want to kind of promote their own stuff and uh, and so they kind of get clickbaity and uh, not. I think anybody can write for me, but or write for us. But the, I have to find it original and interesting, and uh, and I generally narrow and deep rather than broad and shallow, and. Uh, it's hard to write that way. Yeah, absolutely. This kind of leads into the next one, which is uh, quiet professionalism. Um, so Rob's written a host of essays on quiet professionalism. Um, and, you know, as within the first principles, our work ethos embodies quiet professionalism, prioritizing the mission, craftsmanship, and humility. So obviously, this is a problem for... Uh, consumer facing business, right? How do we grow the company while maintaining 
the tenets of quiet professionalism. And kind of the follow-up question is, are we willing to let the company fail in order to follow quiet professional tenants? So I'd point that question to Rob. So I, the, the question I, I think comes back to this idea. Well, I guess my, my answer to that is I always wanted to be a, a 20 year company rather than a, you know, a five year company that kind of burns hot and flames out. And, um, and I think that these principles help us maybe not grow, but survive um, because the, the focus is on the product and humility and that I think improves the product. Understand that I am an aspiring quiet professional and not an expert and certainly, you know, with this idea of, you know, we just pointed out with the app how I can be righteous and not be quite professional about some stuff. So um, I'm an aspiring quiet professional and, and it's kind of like stuff you got to work on every day. Um, so yeah, I think it certainly affects our our uh, growth potential. I mean, it's a very competitive world, and fitness is a really cheesy can be a really cheesy industry. And um, I mean, understand the athletes that we're working with that we want to work with, who are professionals in mountain tactical worlds and professional about their fitness. I think they're looking for something that aligns with that level of seriousness. And we could have easily crossed the line by, you know, videos of scantily clad women training or, I mean, it's, if you just look online, it's so easy to see fitness coaches training with their shirts off, just crap like that. It's really easy to cross this red line in the fitness industry and kind of, you know, cross over into douchebaggery. And I think once you've done that, you're done um, in terms of working with these professionals that we want to work with for sure. Um, so does it affect our growth? Absolutely. Um, or potential growth, because we're not trying to be everything to everybody. And we, I mean, when it comes just to advertising, we, we have certain standards and we, we don't want to, we don't want to come close to that line. Um, does it affect our survivability? I would say, yeah, I think that it may help us be around another, I mean, we've always almost been around 20 years. And so hopefully it'll help us stick around for another 20 years. Um, um, and I, I like the idea of being a long-term business, you know, rather than a, a short-term flame out. So uh, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> it does. It does. Uh, it does affect our potential to grow. Um, but uh, we're not trying to be everything for everybody. We're not trying to be a fitness source for every, you know, soldier or firefighter or mountaineer. Some of those guys just don't want to train as hard or as professionally as we are going to program, and that's fine. We're we're looking for, the, for those those people who. Those athletes who, who do understand and appreciate, you know, the work the work that we do, and and uh, and are willing to pay for it. You know, all these guys are paying for it out of their own pocket, and they appreciate quality, and, and they pay for it. And uh, um, it's, that's not everybody for sure. Yeah, it's certainly a challenge. I mean, I think I've been working for Rob in one way or another for about close to eight years now um and it's certainly from a business perspective makes life super challenging uh you know in terms of trying to increase the impact of the company and and the growth of the company but i mean it's nice uh, it's a from my own career perspective it's a luxury to have uh those principles kind of outlined and and we know that we're just not going to fuck with, you know, that thing, whatever that cheesy thing is that doesn't fall within the parameters of quiet professionalism. Uh, you know, it's a pain in the ass, but it's also, it's also great. You know, I, I enjoy working for a company that 
has that kind of principled standpoint because that's certainly not always the case professor pro especially in the uh in the business world right it's easy to I, I think it's probably easier to do this uh with military law enforcement fire etc um because that's a choice if you're going to kind of veer to the other side um and you want to be an influencer or whatever the case may be no no hate on those guys but it's just not what we're going to do. Um, you got anything to add on that one, Kelson? Uh, no, this is probably one of my favorite principles. Um, I think it, it just goes to show, I think it ties into being uh, a professional, uh, professionalism and fitness, you know, and, and you're, you're seeking out those people that, that'll like have a very focused approach on something. So it's always something I've appreciated um, just in my time in the military. And I kind of, that's kind of the way I like to live. I like to stay off the radar and do my own thing. Yeah. I like this uh, podcast with no, no uh, images of our face or no video of our face. I think we'll probably keep this cause I think it, it's a good way, right? It's uh saying relatively anonymous but talking about the business and what we do i think it's good stuff I'm taking i mean we already got one takeaway which is <laughs> acts in the uh community building principle <clears throat> the challenge i think from a business perspective is you know i have a working definition of quiet professionalism that i, I keep on cranking on and it's uh another definition is a commitment to craftsmanship and mission completion and absent self-promotion and it's a self-promotion thing that kind of, you know, hurts, I think, not hurts, but impacts business growth because it really ties into how we present ourselves and how we advertise um, and, and all that other stuff. So I think it's a, it's not necessarily a obstacle, it's a challenge. And, uh, um, and I think we just have some, need to have some faith that, this is a way to move forward and and uh well it is i want to do it any other way so if we if we're going to fail because we're quite professionals i'll do something else yeah right? so yep. easy yeah agreed cool well that's the list of questions any other follow-up comments or anything else that you guys wanted to add in thank you charlie appreciate you yeah absolutely uh hopefully we'll get these things going pretty regularly good conversation uh, i think this would have been really interesting to do without recording it period so good exercise for us you know to continue to try and improve and keep it moving sweet thanks for listening to the first episode of the mti podcast many more to come thanks guys